Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, jointly sponsored by Alliance for Global Justice and Nicaragua Solidarity Campaign Action Group, entitled U.S. Hands Off, Let the People Decide, Democratic Elections as a Guarantee of Social Progress and National Sovereignty. Our speakers today are Nan McCurdy, Francisco Dominguez, Netfa Freeman and Sophia Clark. We look forward to audience participation during the question and answer period. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be sent to all registrants within the next few days. Today we have two co-moderators. My name is Barbara Larkham and I couldn't be happier to be talking to you from San Juan de Limay, Nicaragua. I'm the coordinator of the Casa Baltimore Limay Friendship Project linked with San Juan de Limay. Hello, and I'm Louise Richards, Trade Union and Communications Coordinator of the Nicaragua Solidarity Campaign Action Group based in London, United Kingdom. So I'm speaking to you this evening from the United Kingdom. It's evening in the UK anyway. Uh, first of all, special thanks to our, the people providing our technical support today. That's Elaine Spivak Rodriguez and Madeleine McClure from Alliance for Global Justice. Before we begin, we have a number of announcements, but we'll make sure to post all the links in chat as well. To stay up to date with events and issues in Nicaragua, you can sign up for the NicaNet email list, a Google group moderated list for people who support Nicaragua's progress and sovereignty. The link to sign up will be entered in the chat shortly. You can also sign up for Nika Notes, which includes a weekly article by an invited author, followed by news updates of the week at the Alliance for Global Justice website, afgj.org. Several books about Nicaragua are also available at that same website, afgj.org, free in English and Spanish, downloadable in several formats, and you can also refer to the Nicaragua Solidarity Campaign Action Group website at nscag.org. There is a bill called the Reina Serre Act, which is making its way through Congress that would impose harmful new sanctions on Nicaragua. It already passed the Senate, and recently the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee held a very one-sided hearing criticizing Nicaragua. The Reina Serre Act has also passed through one committee in the House of Representatives, uh, but it is still in the House Financial Services Committee chaired by Representative Maxine Waters, so it is not too late to register your opposition to this harmful bill. We strongly urge you to call Representative Waters and then also call the direct line for her committee. We will post the information in the chat Ask Chairwoman Maxine Waters to oppose the Reina Serra Act and not mark it up or move it through her committee. So far, we've been very happy that this has not happened. We wanna keep it that way. The Reina Serra Act proposes targeted sanctions against more than half of the population of Nicaragua. And in fact, everyone living in the country would suffer because the entire government would be targeted. Sanctions hurt the most vulnerable people and the U.S. must stop waging war this way. If you would like to become more active in opposing the Reina Serra Act and U.S. interference in Nicaragua generally, you're invited to join our NicaNet Advocacy Committee. Please put your name and your email address in the Q&A if you're interested in this. Okay. Uh, this webinar is part of a series occurring about once a month. Please mark your calendars for Sunday, November 21st, at the same time as today in the United States, but one hour later in the UK. The topic will be a report back from numerous eyewitnesses to the Nicaraguan elections. The format for today's 90 minute webinar is the following. First, Nam McCurdy will do a brief Nicaraguan Elections 101 overview of the Nicaraguan political system and how the electoral process works. Then each of the other three speakers will have 12 minutes for their presentations, which will allow plenty of time at the end for questions and answers for those attending. 
You can put your comments in the chat, but please make sure you put any questions intended for the speakers in the Q&A. We'll be pulling those questions later to address to the panelists. Could I also mention that for those who need it, we also have a live transcript for the meeting. That's the button at the bottom right hand corner of your screen where it says live transcript if you need to access the live transcript. Thank you. And now to introduce our first speaker. Nan McCurdy is the editor of the online weekly Nika Notes. She's a United Methodist missionary working in development in the countryside of Mexico. She lived in Nicaragua for over 30 years and continues to have deep connections there. Nan McCurdy, you have the floor. Nan, you're muted. Uh, pardon me. Thank you, Barbara. Hi to everyone. It's great to be here with you. Thanks for joining us. And I'm speaking to you from Nicaragua. I arrived yesterday so that I can cover the elections. In exactly one week, over 3 million Nicaraguans will go to the polls at 13,459 polling stations in 3,100 voting centers across the country. They will vote for 90 deputies to the National Assembly, 20 deputies to the Central American Parliament, Parlesen, President and Vice President. They are elected on one ballot for five-year terms. 90 deputies to the legislature, called the National Assembly, are elected by popular vote on proportional representation basis from party lists. 20 nationally and 70 representing the country's 15 geographic departments and two autonomous regions. The Central American Parliament serves as a forum to discuss common issues of the Central America area. The National Assembly elects the magistrates of the Supreme Electoral Council, SEC, which is a fourth autonomous branch of government. The SEC administers the elections according to the Constitution and electoral law. Ten new Supreme Electoral Council magistrates were sworn in May 6th with 60% women and a historic representation of the multi-ethnic Caribbean coast, 40%. The magistrates elect their own council president and vice president. President Brenda Rocha, a lawyer, is from Bonanza, North Caribbean Autonomous Region. She lost an arm in 1982 when she was 15 in a contra attack on a hydroelectric plant. She was the only survivor, and she was one of the people there to defend the plant. In May, reforms to the electoral law were passed, including gender parity among electoral officials, digital auditing, and traceability of voting tallies. Every municipality, department, and region has an electoral council of three people and three alternates, once again with gender parity. The electoral law awards the top positions in each of these councils to the parties with the highest percentage of the vote in the last election. In 2016, the FSLN and the PLC, which is the Constitutional Liberal Party, were the top two parties. Based on those results, an FSLN member is president in nine departmental councils, and the first member is from the Liberal Constitutional Party. A PLC member is president of eight departmental councils, and the first member is an FSLN party member. The second member is from another party. The 13,459 local polling station boards, more than there have ever been before, are made up of three people, a president, a first member, and a second member. They are usually classrooms in a school. There are 3,106 voting centers, usually schools. 
made up of these 13,459 polling stations. Municipal electoral councils appoint members of each polling station. The president and first member of each station of the board of each station alternate between the political parties that obtain the first and second place in the last general election in that particular polling station. The third member is from another party and the rest of the parties, or in other words, all the parties can designate a poll watcher in each polling station. So there are uh, uh, nearly 200,000 poll watchers from the different parties. An impressive number of volunteers carry out Nicaragua's elections. If you add up all the volunteers, it comes to about 245,000 people. In a show of support for their electoral system, nearly 3 million Nicaraguans participated in citizen verification days in July at 3,106 voting centers to confirm or change their address. This gives an idea of the minimum number that will vote on November 7th, probably around 3 million people. On August 8th, the SEC published the respective electoral roll in the 3,106 voting centers. Each party received a copy of the electoral roll. Each citizen may go to their polling place any day to confirm if they appear on the list. On September 22nd, the definitive electoral roll was published and includes 4,478,334 voters. In May, alliances among parties were registered. There is one national alliance, United Nicaragua Triumphs, which is made up of nine political parties, including the FSLN, six political movements and four social movements. From July 28 to August 2nd, six parties and one alliance registered about 1,500 candidates for the election, including the candidates for president, vice president, National Assembly deputies and Central American Parliament deputies. And on September 3rd, the SEC published the final list of candidates. The elections were open to all parties, which complied with electoral laws and procedures. In 2020, the time for fulfilling requirements to form new parties was extended by six months to facilitate registration by new parties. So that was open even last spring, but no new parties registered. On September 20th, the Ministry of Health and the SEC agreed on a COVID health protocol for the electoral campaign. Political parties should avoid massive face-to-face -face events and prioritize virtual and digital mechanisms to publicize their governing plans in a safer way. Face-to-face -face political activities should be held in open areas for no more than an hour and a half and no more than 200 people. The six parties and one alliance started their campaign September 25th. The campaign period lasts through November 3rd, which is this coming Wednesday. The SEC says that parties will develop activities aimed at obtaining the votes of the citizens, explaining their ideological principles, their political, social, and economic programs, and their platforms. The SEC accredited about 81,000 board members of the 13,459 polling stations on October 14th. That's three board members of each polling station and three alternates. The SEC has already delivered the electoral man manual to train all the technicians who will work in the electoral process. And by now everyone is trained, including volunteers to be polling center police. The SEC, um, I'm sorry, one more thing. The SEC trained the party poll watchers, which here are called fiscales, 
who have these faculties to be present in the premises and supervise the operation of each voting board during the voting day until the delivery of the minutes and materials uh, to the SEC. They may also request copies of the voting minutes and from experience of being an observer, everyone there gets a copy of the minutes of exactly what happened and everything is signed at the beginning of the day and the end of the day. Thank you so much. Excuse me, I was muted too. Um, thank you so much now for such an excellent and informative uh, presentation. Our next speaker is Francisco Dominguez, who is a member of the Executive Committee of NSCAG. He's head of the Latin American Studies Research Group at Middlesex University in London, UK, and is a specialist on contemporary Latin American political economy, about which he's written extensively. Francisco is a former refugee from Pinochet's Chile, and since his arrival in the UK back in the 70s, he's been a leading member of Solidarity Acti Activities with Latin America. Please welcome Francisco Dominguez. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Luis. Um, this is an extremely timely event, and I think we should all be very happy that this is happening. That level of detail given to us and to the audience by none is absolutely vital. You don't have to have any ideology or have any position to accept that this is exactly the way the elections are taking place. And this takes me right into the subject of my talk, which is the issue of democracy and the FSLN in Nicaragua, which I think perhaps has been neglected not necessarily that hasn't been discussed, but it hasn't been made explicit in the presentation of discussion articles, documents, books, and so on. It is impossible to understand the difficulties in building democracy in a country such as Nicaragua without understanding also the intense, persistent, um, decades of US intervention in the country. Um, you know, you can go back all the way to the 19th century and you could see that from the point of view of the expansion of, I would call it US imperialism, Nicaragua was absolutely essential in order for the United States to be able to organize the trade between its Eastern and Western coasts. And this took place through Nicaragua. So much so that Cornelius Vanderbilt not only forced or pushed the Nicaraguan government into an agreement by which he will have monopoly over that route, but on top of that, he even thought of building an interoceanic inter canal, which was in discussions for a long time. Um, and then given the geopolitical importance of this little country, then even France, was interested in building a canal. So given that the United States wanted to secure an after expansion was successful after it intervened in Cuba in 1898, then the United States intervened very heavily in the Caribbean in Central America. And from 1909, US direct military, political, economic, commercial pressure was on the country ever since. And when the United States was defeated by Sandino after the 1926-1933 military intervention, then it realized that it had to leave something that guarantee is control in every possible sense of this country and therefore left the Somoza dynasty, which lasted all the way to 1979. And anybody who may think, uh, I, I think there are very few of those elements. Anybody who may think that somehow the Nicaraguans, for whatever reasons, failed to build democracy because of their own mistakes, they are completely wrong. In was the United States, it was the central obstacle, which was an active obstacle. Imagine Nicaragua is being the second, perhaps second most poor, poorest country in the region. 
and he has to undergo the pressure of this giant, this colossus, which was the United States. And um, all the way from 1933, 1934, the Nicaraguans could not build democracy because of the United States hiding behind the facade of the Somoza dictatorship. And they started by, you know, participating in whatever fashion in the assassination of General Somoza himself. And you could see all the way through uh, the legacy, all the way through the repression that the Somoza dictatorship was applied under every single point. The United States supported the dictatorship rather than support the democracy, absolutely every single time. And the legacy was absolutely terrible. I just want to give some figures. By 1971-75, military spending in Nicaragua was three times more than spending on health. The National Guard was made up of 15,000 um, soldiers, brutal soldiers. And at the time, at the same, the same period, there were only 13,000 teachers and 1,400 physicians or doctors. The overall level of mortality was 30.9 per, per 1,000. Infant mortality was 120 per 1,000. In other words, extremely high. And the level of expectancy in 1979 was actually only 55 years old. So that gives you an idea of the problem. And illiteracy by 1979 was 52%, um, and so on and so forth. And the distribution of that illiteracy was that 70% of that total was in the countryside, and only 20% of that total was in the urban areas. So that gives you an idea of the problem. And the average school attendance at the time was 2.4 years. Um, in other words, there was a 76% drop out of schooling, a dropout. So terrible. The situation was absolutely, absolutely terrible. And we know what the FCLN in power was able to do from 1979 to 1990. I don't have the time to go into all of these details. But all of those indexes that I mentioned were absolutely reversed. The trouble was that as democracy was being built and the FSLN demonstrated that was totally committed to democracy, and one can mention, I can want to mention two instances of this. The first one is 1984. The FSLN got to power as a result of an army insurrection, didn't have to organize elections. Nevertheless, it did. Even better, didn't have to organize elections with all the parties that were present, but it did. So the most democratic and open elections ever to be held in that country since it became an independent nation was in 1984, thanks to the position and the principles of the FSLN. So this is extremely important to highlight. And that election in 1984 was taking place in the middle of the Contra war organized by the United States, precisely because the United States was trying to destroy every possible effort for the people of Nicaragua to have an alternative path through their own means, that is to say, through their own democracy and so on. And it couldn't do it. And, you know, they eventually destroyed the country in 1990. Just to give you an idea, as a consequence of the um, Contra war, as a result of the election that the FSLN organized at the party, the FSLN won uh, the election in 1984 with 67% of the vote. And all the other parties you know, were present there. And I'll, I'll just give you um, an idea of the level of participation that was completely unusual in that country up to that point. 75% turnout. 93% valid votes on that. And exactly as the election takes place, the Reagan administration described that election in 1984, confirming the point I've been making, which is the United States has been the obstacle. They announced the election of 1984 as a Soviet style sham. That was the official position. That gives you an idea exactly of where things lie. And then the Contra War took its toll, as we know. It was terrible, more than 50,000 people were murdered as a result of the 
atrocities perpetrated by those who have been trained, financed, and organized by the United States, 50,000 people in such a poor country that was forced to divert precious resources for its social development, education, health, and everything else that was necessary for the people in order to defend the country. And the consequences were, you know, that in 1990, the United States blackmailed black the Nicaraguan population to say, if you keep voting for the FSLN, I'll intensify the war. If you don't vote for the FSLN, we will stop it. And the consequence was that the FSLN lost the election. But this is the most extraordinary thing. The FSLN in 1990 knew that those who would come to power with a neoliberal pro-US agenda were going to enter into all sorts of contradictions and were going to create all sorts of crises and all sorts of compl complications. And the FSLN had such enormous influence among former combatants. It had enormous influence in the police. It had enormous influence in the army. And yet the FSLN, because it was committed to democracy, decided not to go for terminal confrontations, so, you know, confrontations to the finish, and respected the decision of the people, even though this was achieved under duress from the president of the United States from 1990 to 2006. So it's extraordinary, in my view, that between 1990 and 2006, that is to say 16 years, the FSLN waited, respected, participated, and put up with a lot of stuff that we know. Um, he managed to win back in, in 2006. And then from 2006, he won with 38%. In the next election, he went up to 64%. In the next election, went up to 72 and then to 75%. And possibly is, is where it is. So, I want to finish with, with a couple of points here. Number one, there is an argument um, among some misguided progressive people, I suppose influenced by newspapers such as The Guardian and worse. And the idea is that the current FSLN does not represent the continuation of what began in 1979. And I was wondering, how do we judge that that is the case? How do we decide that this is, you know, one of the two is correct or incorrect? Those who have presented themselves, in my view, falsely, as the genuine continuations of um, the FSLN in 1979, who have been critics of the FSLN, of the current FSLN denouncing, the FZLN and the government of the FZLN has all sorts of things. In 1990, they, uh, in 1990, they score because they began to express differences that when you are defeated, inevitably, you know, differences and contradictions will emerge within your movement. In the 1990 election, they presented themselves as critical of the FZLN. I think it's sort of the same story current somehow they got 0.78%, less than 1%. In the election in 1996, they obtained 0.44%. In the 2001 election, they sort of disappeared and they supported somebody else, the same current. In 2006, as a result of them supporting a right-wing candidate, the right-wing candidate managed to pull 644%. And I think in, in the last election, they scored very little. In other words, if we say that the people of Nicaragua have made their choice and they have told us who, which is the real FSLN. And when it came to the 2018 coup d'etat, coup attempt, again, the FSLN at the very beginning, given that it has control over the army, given that it has control, you know, legitimate control over the police forces and the armed forces. And he had a tremendously powerful movement. He could have unleashed, let me use that expression, he could have unleashed that movement and really go for a massive confrontation. And I remember representatives of the FSLN in London explaining to us 
that they wouldn't do that because that would destroy the democracy that's taken them so long to build. He said, we will enter into an escalation that will end up in a civil war, allowing all sorts of characters outside our country as well as inside, of course, including the United States, to actually come in, create or escalate, exacerbate the civil war, and you know, destroy the democracy that it took us so long to build. So they decided to actually step back and wait for the process to actually unfold until people were totally clear about that. So two final conclusions from me. Number one, the real continuator of the democracy that began in 1979, which was the first time where the country did enjoy democracy, is the current government of the FZLN. In my view, there is no question about it. They could have gone for something much more dramatic. They would have destroyed the democracy and the elections that are taking place today would not be taking place in the conditions that Nan just explained a minute ago. Only an organization, a movement, a vision of the country, which is committed to that democracy is possible, um, can only achieve that. And the argument that the FSLN is authoritarian is not true. It's not true because of everything that I've said. The only and serious threat or to democracy in Nicaragua is the United States and its accomplices domestically as well as internationally. So therefore, you know, all the best for the democracy of Nicaragua. Absolutely my whole wholehearted support for the elections and the democratic ways in which you are resolving your internal difficulties, which is the right way. And I know that this is going to be successful. As a consequence of this, democracy will continue to flourish. And democracy in Nicaragua is the precondition for the wonderful social progress that has been made ever since 1979 up to now as we speak. Long live this wonderful little country, Nicaragua. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. Our next speaker is Nefa Freeman, who is an organizer in Pan-African Community Action, or PACA, and on the coordinating committee of the Black Alliance for Peace. Nefa is also co-host and producer of the WPFW radio show and podcast, Voices with Vision, on 89.3 FM, Washington, DC. Nefa Freeman, welcome, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, opportunity to address uh, so many distinguished people. Um, let me start off by saying uh, some of the very relevant comments by Francisco, particularly when he was talking about the um, indices uh, and the achievements of the Sandinistas are ironic in the sense that right now the United States is watching uh, or just finished watching the Biden administration and the Democratic Party actually negotiate about things that should be the human rights of the people in the US, but yet this is supposed to be the beacon of democracy. Um, and so there are lessons from, you know, lessons for uh, this and, and, and the achievements of the Nicaraguan revolution for the domestic colony of African and indigenous people in the US. I have to start off by saying PACA, Pan-African Community Action. Um, and some of, the, some of us in uh, the Black Alliance for Peace um, assert that, you know, we don't come from this, the solidarity with Nicaragua um, and the revolution from the standpoint of uh, trying to do something to make our government do the right thing. Uh, this government is a colonizing force for us. We are a colonial, uh, a domestic colony within the United States. And so our relationship um, and our struggle is one with the people of Nicaragua. Um, and so we have to view things from that standpoint. That's a tool of analysis we have to use. Um, so this is where we're coming from, the Sandinista revolution and the people, particularly um, people of African descent on uh, the Caribbean coast, and I just got finished being able to be there in a very short but very intense and dense uh, experience last July and visited and, and went throughout uh, various places in the country and um, uh, on the Pacific coast and then even 
uh, for a shorter time, but still a very instructive time on the Caribbean coast, a meeting with five people. And so there's a lot of lessons. And I think I'm going to try to recount some of those here. Um, uh, and, and so uh, uh, for one is that, and some of it is more information within the four years of returning to power. And I think uh, Francisco and, and some before that uh, talked about some of the achievements after the neoliberal period in July uh, 2007, I mean, January 2007, after coming to power, the Sandinistas were able to uh, grant um, indigenous and Afro-descendant peoples title to uh, 15 territories covering more than 200 million hectares of land in the country. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, in terms of the, the process for decolonization and that the revolution represents a decolonization in the country. And when I visited the, on the Caribbean coast and, and a lot of people, one of the things I was told was that there's a saying that says autonomy is the revolution. Uh, and so the the giving uh, the dis redistribution of land um, and the and the recognition of the autonomous regions by uh, law the autonomous law number twenty eight was part of well distribution of land was part of the law implementation of law uh, twenty eight um, and in that was recognizing uh, uh, the uh, indigenous languages and the Creole uh, English predominantly Creole English language on the Caribbean coast recognizing them as official languages uh, and and uh, doing away with the Euro centric imposition of Spanish on the peoples there, uh, the right to uh, govern the territories that were that were recognized uh, that they had been living on for centuries according to their own customs and rules and, and the ability to adopt uh, their own uh, or implement their own laws as long as they're not incompatible with the sovereign rights of the Republic of Nicaragua as a whole. Uh, this is, you know, a remarkable transformation. It's the only place if we consider the fact that uh, the uh, Black and Indigenous type of the, particularly the Caribbean coast type of uh, population and history all the way from Belize down to Panama, Nicaragua shares this with other countries, but Nicaragua and the Sandinista revolution is the only one that has something like the autonomous law uh, 28. And this, is a, this should be representative, uh, uh, recognized as a revolutionary, a revolutionary thing. Um, and the national state is bound uh, to protect the autonomous regions from external threats. So this is something that is very instructive for uh, people in the United States, particularly those of us who consider ourselves in a net domestic colony and the fight is for power um, and not for reformism. The, you know, a lot of the lessons from Nicaragua um, show us and demonstrate that the struggle is for power. Uh, right now we're seeing in the United States with this uh, inability to really demonstrate anything this centered on people, the centered on human rights of the people is trying to undermine uh, the revolution in Nicaragua and other places as well. And one of the, they have a whole bunch of means to do that. One of the means is to uh, use um, NGOs, non-governmental organizations and stirring up confusion, uh, organizations that are pretending to be in the interests of indigenous and black peoples. Um, and, but there are situations, nothing perfect. And when you're trying to embark on a project like Nicaragua is embarking on, there are very uh, complex uh, scenarios that arise. And so what the, 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 uh, the strategy is, is to promote these scenarios and uh, uh, get rid of the complexity and context of what they represent and use them as misinformation to discredit the revolution. And so this is something that we have to be, uh, uh, we have to be weary of. And in fact, if we just use a little, just apply a little logic and then understanding some of the achievements with universal health care and education and the, uh, the uh, redistribution of, of land and the different socialist projects, it really doesn't make sense. Some of the, the accusations that are leveled against the Sandinista government don't really make sense in a sense of a project that would do some of, some of the things that it's doing now or has been able to achieve now to turn around and do uh, uh, some of the, the uh, commit some of the atrocities that it's being accused of. It just doesn't make sense. It's an, an attempt 
uh, by the US government to exploit identity politics in countries uh, that are in the period that's crosshairs. We're seeing it in other places in, in uh, Cuba, we're seeing it in Nicaragua, I mean, in Venezuela, we're seeing them trying to exploit uh, the sentiments of those of us who've emerged and, uh, and tried to assert uh, uh, African or black um, uh, self-determination and affinities, but try to exploit that and divorce it from the, the broader struggle for humanity and against capitalism and imperialism. In the United States, and this goes back to uh, some of the, one of the experiences we had in, um, in Nicaragua, we have, and PACA has a community control of police campaigns, and there's not just us, but the community control of the police are struggles for autonomy and self-determination within the United States, and that's how they should be seen, not struggles for reform. Uh, one of the things that PACA and Black Alliance for Peace were uh, able to do before I was even went to Nicaragua was um, be a part of a um, a webinar, Power to the People, Policing and Caribbean Autonomy in Nicaragua. I'm going to put the put the hopefully I can put the um. Let me see if I can put the YouTube in the chat because it was a great, very instructive webinar, um, and it just showed um, the 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 struggle and its connection to establishing or, or fighting against uh, imperialism and, and capitalism and the development and the, the transformations that Nicaragua had to go to in order to do that. Um, let me see. Let me do this right now before I forget and get away with this. Um, so please take a look at that. Um, our national organizer, John Baraka, gave some very instructive words on that uh, webinar, and it was really, really instructive for all of us. Uh, when I got, when we finally got down and visited Nicaragua, and I have to give hats off to a dear friend now, Co Colleen, who hosted us and made that, and also Sydney, uh, 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 Sid Sydney Francis on the Caribbean coast, who really made our, our trip rich there. One of the things we did was also we were able to sit down with uh, one of the founders of the Nicaraguan uh, uh, police, national police. That webinar also has uh, some women who were part of the founding of the national police and the, and the, and the development of that. But in we were in the uh, Pacific coast in Managua, we were able to sit down with Francisco Javier Bautista Laura, who is the author. He was one of the founders of the national police, also the author of uh, the, a book, Police uh, Citizen Security and violence in Nicaragua, brief essays and a testimony. Um, and and have to hear him talk about the one, the, uh, the not, not just him, but also on the webinar, talking about the transformation, having to go through uh, abolishing the Samosa National Guard and even assuming control and power in the country and to deal with all the plethora of contradictions that any country has, particularly under the ravages of capitalism and neoliberalism exploitation was very instructive in establishing a police force um, that was, um, there was reflective of, uh, uh, you know, facilitated um, the the uh, human rights and looked out for the human rights of the people as opposed to something else. So uh, the lessons in, in that were very instructive. People-centered human rights development of police, um, and we and in Nicaragua also the just the the. Um, the lessons we have from history, and I would count to, and then the connections between the struggles in Nicaragua and the struggles within the United States of the domestic colony. Many people may have heard of the journalist Gary Webb. He wrote a book, Dark Alliances. He was, he, they claimed that he was assassinated, but you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, speculation that he was, I mean, the claim he was murdered. I mean, he, I'm sorry, committed suicide, but there's a lot of speculation that he was assassinated. He, in this book, he shows how the U.S. orchestrated contra war against Nicaragua and its Sandinista government helped the CIA facilitate the explosion of crack cocaine into African Black communities across the United States and also uh, 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 gave, lent itself to the mass incarceration that we're seeing and that we have to fight against in the United States around uh, with trying to take control from our community, in our communities. And so Nicaragua, we assert that Nicaragua is uh, part of what I call the axis of decolonization. 
in the Western Hemisphere. Among the modern day challenges uh, uh, in the modern day expression of the Monroe Doctrine, which is really nothing but uh, white supremacy and, uh, and, and the manifest destiny and those sort of things that the United States and settler colonialist in the United States has been trying to implement. Uh, and so now with the modern day expressions of it, we're seeing Southcom. So Black Alliance for Peace, we are taking up campaigns against the militarization uh, by the United States of the entire world, particularly Southcom in the Western Hemisphere, uh, calling for and uh, and and helping to build that establishment of the zone of peace that many of the governments in Latin America or, or the leadership in Latin America has uh, has has led, uh, have led. And then, you know, the sanctions. We know that Nicaragua is experiencing, we have to see sanctions as an act of war. Sanctions are part of the multifaceted, protracted war against the people of Nicaragua and among other, uh, uh, and all the other, you know, others among uh, humanity struggling for self-determination, liberation, and liberation. Yes. By yes. uh, two minutes. Okay, so I, I, can, I can end there. Uh, we know that uh, that the peace that the people I know that the people in in the Caribbean coast are looking forward to the elections. Uh, they've talked about the fact that now is they're going to be able to uh, participate with better uh, improved access to land, water, and air. And they, to me, uh, my experience has been that the you know with autonomy being the revolution, they are wholeheartedly Sandinista, and we are in wholehearted solidarity with the people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Netfa. Thank you. Our final speaker is Sophia Clark, a political researcher and analyst with deep ties to Nicaragua. A master of international law, she was deputy chief of staff for her uncle, Miguel de Scotto, when he presided over the 63rd session of the United Nations General Assembly. She served in UN field missions in Rwanda, South Africa, and Haiti, and worked in OAS conflict resolution programs in Guatemala, Bolivia, and Colombia. She's currently at the Miguel de Scotto Brockman Center for Development Studies at the National Autonomous University of Nicaragua, UNAN in Managua. Please welcome Sophia Clark, the floor is yours. Good afternoon and good evening to our friends in the English speaking part of the world and also here in Nicaragua. First, I wanna thank you for doing this and I want to clarify my deep ties to Nicaragua. I am Nicaragua. I may look not like uh, what you expect a Nicaraguan to look like, but I am both heart and soul uh, Nicaraguan. Uh, I'm gonna start with a rather unusual lead and what I want to say is, despite all the many wonderful things that Nicaragua does, and Nicaragua is not perfect. And that may seem unusual, but I wanna stress this to listeners because Nicaragua does not have to prove itself worthy. We don't have to earn the right to get the yoke of the United States off of us, which means we do not have to earn the right not to be bullied, not to be subject to illegal sanctions and not to be subject to coercion. That is our right. We have the right to experiment. We have the right to choose our development priorities. We have the right to hold our sovereign elections. Those are rights that we have as Nicaraguans. Now, I, I think it's, there's a few points I would like to underscore and there's many I wanna make, so I'll try to be fast. And I hope if I miss some key points or if you have questions, feel free to ask. I think it's important because Nicaragua has been described as an extraordinary and unusual threat to the foreign policy and national security of the United States. That's patently absurd, okay? Nicaragua does not constitute a threat extraordinary or otherwise to any of its neighbors, to the United States or any other country. On the contrary, we have a proven record in drug interdiction efforts, respect for the rule of law, and in promoting and facilitating regional integration. And that means in trade, that means in public health measures, that means in sporting events, and in other areas. Okay, another point is that Nicaragua is one of the poorest countries in the hemisphere rightfully is concerned about its development priorities. 
rights. I think that's, you know, it's not, we don't just look at human rights as dealing with political and civic liberties, but it also deals with economic, social, and cultural rights as well. And these collective rights are not in the air in a vacuum. There's an interaction between different human rights and we have to prove and develop policies that complement and reinforce. And at sometimes they take away privileges. Taking away privileges is not the same as violating human rights. And those are difficult questions for any government to make, but Nicaragua has been making them. Um, as you know, I've said in previous webinars, the very first act presidential act of Daniel Ortega was to the restitution of the constitutional right to universal health care and education. And I say that because it was meant from the get go to be a rebuttal to these neoliberal policies that had brought to Nicaragua an increase in poverty, declines in health indicators that Nicaragua managed to sustain even during the Contra War. We had massive immunization programs and others that actually increased health in Nicaragua and we went backwards under the neoliberal government. We had food scarcity and we had hunger. What do we have today? What does Nicaragua stand for at home? We're fighting for greater access to public services. That includes universal health care, education at all levels. I'm talking about preschool, all the way up to the university level. We're talking about electricity for all. Over 99% of Nicaraguans have electricity. When Daniel Ortega came into office in 2007, 54% had access to electricity. We have cheap public transportation in safe, comfortable new buses. We have housing for low and middle income families. We have microcredit. We have road systems which get produce to market, but they also connect the Atlantic coast with the Pacific, and they also connect the autonomous regions, the North um, autonomous with the South autonomous region. That's an interconnectivity that Nicaragua has never had. We are involved in the largest modernization program in our nation's history, and I would even say in the history of the Central American region. That's what we stand for at home. What do we stand for internationally? Okay, Nicaragua has promoted vigorous and binding commitments to reduce and mitigate climate change, the impact of global warming. We have fought to promote climate justice and to grant access of countries that are impacted by climate change, and Nicaragua certainly is, and we are not the producers of these carbon emissions and other groundfall, but to make sure that there's access to the green fund and to green technologies. We fought for equitable vaccine access. We have fought for access in international lending institutions based on merit, not on political conditionality. And we have promoted the rule of law and including most importantly, respect for the UN charter. That's who we are internationally. Can the United States say the same? Um, let me double check some other questions I wanted. I think it's important to ask what interests the US supports at home. Is it fighting for universal health care? for the rights of indigenous peoples, blacks and other minorities? Is it fighting for community-based policing? Is it fighting to stop the opiate crisis? Is it fighting to build better road systems or universal access to education or to improve its own anacrostic electoral system? and to broaden its so-called two-party political system to include other political groups. And I would ask, if they don't do that at home, then why do so many people pretend that the United States is promoting that abroad? 
I think there's a disconnect and a lot more reflection has to be made on those questions. We've seen what the US is doing in many countries and we cannot allow them to get away with the rhetoric. Now, um, I was asked specifically to look a bit at uh, the sanctions regime and also to look at what is happening with what has been in the international media described as the pre-election candidates or the pre-presidential candidates that the terrible dictatorship of Daniel Ortega has put into prison, okay? And it's a difficult, it's a touchy situation. And I think it goes back to what uh, Francisco was mentioning earlier. We have to understand the history of Nicaragua, both in the past and in the present, to understand the degree of US interference in Nicaragua's political process whenever we try to do something that is really meant to improve the lot of the vast majority of people, or if you want to say, of the poor. Okay. Um, I think it's important to point out that Nicaragua enacted legislation that even the UN was encouraging governments to do, which was the Foreign Registration, the Foreign Agents Registration Act. It's based on the US law. And the US own application of their law has gotten increasingly more aggressive in the last 10 and 15 years in regards to China and in regards to Russia. Now, if you're uh, the second poorest country in the hemisphere and you've been put within the sights of the world's superpower at this point and your neighbor to the north, um, I think it's only normal to expect that Nicaragua has decided that it does not have to have an open door policy to invite people who would like to stage coups. We do not have to help in the overthrow of our own government. Quite the opposite. We want to work to protect the gains that we have made and to choose our own political leaders. And, and I say that because the um, we have seen what happened, for example, I think another thing that's important to keep in mind, and I think Francisco alluded to it also, is the fact that elections processes, elections themselves are like a magnet for US intervention, not just in Nicaragua, but around the world, because that's considered an, a good opportunity, a moment to create opposition, to make fuss, and to put in people that are going to support U.S. interests, which usually means they're going to support a market economy, and they're going to support corporate interest, and they're going to support, uh, to al transfer, the defense of private property. I'm not saying that the Nicaraguan government is opposed to these things, but I'm saying that is not the be-all and the end of the Nicaraguan government uh, program. And so when you have people that did in 2018, well, let me take a step back. I think it's important to understand uh, some of our speakers have mentioned the fact that Nicaragua truly brought democracy to Nicaragua. And uh, the 1984 elections, we held elections when we didn't have to. And we did it. Um, in a very deliberate way, but not only did we hold what I think were the first genuine, true broad-based elections in Nicaragua, we also went to the elections in 1990 and to our surprise and to our dismay, because that's the truth, we lost. And Nicaragua, Nicaragua turned over political power to those who won the elections. Okay, that's part of who the Sandinistas are, the FSLN today and then. Okay, um, when Nicaragua won the elections in 2006, the US Embassy worked very hard to try to create an opposition, a more unified and formidable opposition so that they could win the next elections in Nicaragua. And I remember it came out in WikiLeaks. They talked about, there were complaints in the US Embassy about the flatulence of the Nicaraguan opposition, that they could never get their act together. They could never mount a formidable opposition. They were incapable of winning the elections. And 
you went through two periods of elections where the opposition lost and the FSLN support grew. Okay, when we had the election in 2016, and we now had made changes which allowed for Daniel Ortega to be reelected, then I would say that the US stepped up the game and they decided that they were going to do other kinds of measures, including political violence. And when you carried out the acts in 2018, which I'm not gonna go into detail here, but when we went into the acts of 2018 and they failed, then the United States began to move more and more to economic sanctions. And they also began to push again certain parties and the funding that took place in this period from 2007, 2008 to the present is unprecedented. The opposition has received funding. Also, La Prensa has been a, a recipient of, of, of funding from not just USAID, but from other sources. But the funding in Nicaragua went to new historical levels. And it also reflected part of what's happening in, in the international scene. But I think it also shows also a lack of a lack of creativity. The United States is running out of, of diplomatic and other types of options. And foreign affairs, and that's not a, a decidedly not a progressive uh, magazine, put out an article right now in September and October of this year called The United States of Sanctions. And they point out the fact that it could be very natural to be imposing sanctions given the centrality of the US dollar in the international uh, finance system. But what the studies have shown that were done by the University of North Carolina is that in general, the sanctions have not given the desired results. In fact, they say that only in a third to sometimes half do they produce any positive benefits. And yet we seem to be increasingly convinced that this is the way to go. Um, then you have what we've had in Nicaragua were people that justified the violence. And I will just mention, you know, the, the claim because we're hearing it more and more as the elections get close and they're already prepared to, to question the validity of these elections. They were prepared to question it a year ago. They were prepared to question it two years ago when it became clear that they were not going to be able to get the political organization and the breadth of representation throughout the country to actually pose a threat to the Nicaraguan government. Um, uh, upcoming, what I expect to be an upcoming electoral victory. I think it's important to recognize that the first casualty in the events in 2018 was a Nicaraguan police officer. There was one who was killed, but there were other who were severely wounded. Violence was part of the strategy from the beginning of the 2018. It was meant to galvanize the cyber war that was used and the social media that was used to capture the attention of many, many people. When the so desired regime change did not take place quickly, then we began to see these new pieces of legislation, including the NICA Act, which was passed at the end of 2018. You had the um, RAIN, which was approved in 2020, which was supposed to, it's responsive assistance in Nicaragua. And it was meant to promote an orderly transition towards a new government. That included $2 million that was given to help fund the opposition and to help fund what they called independent media. But it was added to approximately 160 million that had been spent on regime effort change in the last few years. If you keep in mind that Nicaragua is a country of 6 million people, that's a lot of money to be throwing at people and it pays for a lot. And it did at that time and I won't get into the, the specifics. And now they're talking about the Renacer Act, 
And the Renacer Act is supposedly meant to help provide for a free and fair elections in Nicaragua. It's also meant to limit the influence of Russia, supposedly in Nicaragua. And I wanna point this out because it goes to the fact of does using these international sanctions, will that really serve as an incentive to Nicaragua? And one of the difficulties that you have and that we're seeing now in recent, um, in the last few years, is that governments are increasingly moving away from the dollar as the only currency for international financial transactions. And that is not just Venezuela or Cuba or Iran or Nicaragua or the 39 countries under US unilateral uh, coercive measures, these illegal unilateral coercive measures. It also includes countries in Europe. They've in created different mechanisms so that they can trade directly with Iran, circumventing the use of the dollar in any of the lending institutions. You've seen Germany look at ways when the US was threatening to apply sanctions for Novid Stream, Nord Stream 2. They were looking at ways that they were going to, they were going to take the sanctions if necessary. Um, I, I point this out because the question is, as a taxpayer, do you want to be supporting programs that in the long run, are they going to actually serve some of your purported security concerns? Is this likely to help Nicaragua actually look for better relations with the United States, or is it likely to improve relations with Russia and possibly move away from the dollar? I don't know. Nicaragua is very limited. We're not Russia and China that have the resources, but what we are seeing is that there are more alternatives open now to countries in the third world that are finding themselves subject to cohesion from the United States and that they don't want to fold. I do wanna point out that the recent example of, of Alex Saab, I think is very, very worrying as then we look at what's possible. I mean, it was on the cover, Reuters was reporting yesterday and um, 60 Minutes is getting ready to hold news. Well, they will be suggesting the possibility of withdrawing Nicaragua from CAFTA, which will greatly affect its, its um, ability to make, well, it will stop its ability to export items to the United States, which is half of its exports go to the United States. So we are aware that even as we move to continue with our national development priorities, that we are, are quite likely going to be subjected to stricter, um, to stricter what they call sanctions in the United States, but these unilateral cohesive measures. And that will make life in Nicaragua difficult, but Nicaragua has shown a certain resiliency and Nicaragua has certain advantages that other countries did not have. It's been emphasized in many of our webinars, the fact that Nicaragua almost has total food sovereignty. That Thank has you. been an, mm -hmm. am I running out of time? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, folks. Um, Just a, a minute or two is good. Uh, Um, I, I just want to point out then, because people are, some people have asked questions and asked me to address the fact that people are being held in prison right now, is that they are not being held because of their political party activity. Interesting to note, none of them belong to a political party. They tried to create a movement and tried to form a political party, but never got themselves together and were actually sort of under the guidance of Ambassador Sullivan here in Nicaragua to see who they would select as the best candidate to mount a kind of coalition against Nicaragua. And the fact is that they never got a political party standing and they are not pre-presidential um, candidates. They are in jail for charges of money laundering which we've seen how the use of, of money that's coming into the Chimoro Foundation, they are being held for acts of treason where they have supported acts of violence. 
and called for the violent overthrow of the government, but not just the violent overthrow of the government, but they have actually asked for certain types of political assassination and other acts. We also know that they were preparing activities, and this is why we go back to the fact that elections are a magnet for US interference, the fear that they would try to do something like they did in Bolivia. And when we look at maritime and land attacks against Venezuela, when we looked at these staged events in Cuba, when we looked at the role of the OAS in helping to promote a coup in, in Bolivia, then we can understand why Nicaragua can rightly be concerned. And when we saw the influx of criminal gang activity in Nicaragua and what looked like new influx of money to support another kind of uprising in Nicaragua, then Nicaragua simply took, I think, the very judicious step that it had the right to protect itself from these kinds of acts. And that's why it had enacted the legislation and it showed a willingness to apply the legislation when necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Um, okay, so Louise and I are going to alternate in asking some questions that have been posed in the Q&A so far. And we also encourage other people, if you have a burning question, go ahead and put that in the Q&A. We are going to prioritize questions that are centered on the elections in some way, since that's the topic for today. But if there's time left over, then we could take a look at some of the other questions. Uh, so my first question can be addressed to Nan and Sophia and anybody else who uh, might want to answer it. I was talking with someone last night here in San Juan de Limay, uh, who is concerned that the opposition parties to the FSLN seem like they're barely campaigning at all. Like uh, this person was not seeing ads, uh, not hearing about rallies or anything like that. And um, so he was starting to get worried that maybe something more might be afoot. And I'm wondering whether any of you think that might be the case or why do you think that they're barely campaigning? I think, they, they, okay. I think they Go are ahead. campaigning, but today most campaigning happens on the internet, is my view, is what I've seen. Go ahead, Sophia. I, I want to, I, I agree with Dan. First of all, it's an unusual electoral climate in Nicaragua because you're not going to see the caravans, you're not going to see the large political activities because we are in a in a period where the pandemic has been felt very strong in the last few months, and there have been large campaigns for vaccination drives most recently. Um, so a lot of it is done by the internet. There's also the problem that some of these parties don't have the ability to give nationwide coverage. And Lamai is still a relatively remote area, even though I understand they just built a new road to get there. I hope you used it, but, um, uh, you know, with the law that has this gender parity, a lot of political parties simply don't have the physical ability to do it. That's why, uh, you know, the question in Nicaragua, I think if you ask most Nicaraguans, is not an issue of whether there's going to be electoral fraud. And some of the opposition, including some members of the Catholic Church, have made the accusation that we're going to have una votación, there's going to be voting. Pero no va a haber una elección, but there's not going to be an election. It's voting because they will vote, but there's nobody to vote for. That's their claim. And I say that because I think that they've done a tremendous job with this new Supreme Electoral Council. I think it's recognized for its integrity, for the safeguards, for the ability of participating political parties to have their presence inside the voter recents. There's all kinds of safeguards. It's not going to be very easy <laughs> to pull off fraud in an election like Nicaragua is planning, and it meets international safeguards. Now, it is not Nicaragua's fault that the opposition has not been capable of mounting a decent political party or alliance to take them on. 
there has been a lot of infighting and it frustrated students at certain points. It frustrated different members of their different alliance. And um, I think they still have a lot of work in order to guarantee that they can have a nationwide um, representation. And another thing I think that Nicaragua has worked real hard and why it does have a nationwide presence is because Nicaragua has worked hard too to involve the autonomous regions into its electoral campaign. It has done a lot to recognize the rights, the collective rights of these communities. It didn't recognize an autonomy in the air. It recognized the autonomous communities of being composed of peoples, of the Manaigna, of the Mesquito, of, of a variety of ethnic groups and as um, Nefta said, we're also looking at literacy work where they're able to, to get education in their own language. And these are tremendous advances that really show a sustained commitment by the FSLN to recognize the, the rights of the autonomous communities which began in the late 1980s and continues. Barbara, I'd like to just add uh, one kind of just basic point, and that is that the US media uh, has really been trying to discount the opposition parties, but the six parties running are all historic parties. Um, one of them is from the, the Caribbean coast and it's running candidates for deputies. It's not running candidates for president and vice president. So there are five opposition parties running president, vice president against the FSLN, against their alliance. They're all historic parties. Everybody knows them. They all have deputies in the National Assembly. There's, there's no reason in the world to, to discount them, except that I, I think everybody here, in case you haven't been following Nicaragua, um, the, the FSLN won by 62% in 2011 and 72.5% in 2016. And there have been advances in every walk of life, so many uh, that you know it's we're likely to have they're gonna win someplace between 63 and 75%. Thank you. Okay. Louise? OK, thank you. Um, sorry, I keep forgetting to unmute myself. Um, a question about the Renaissance Act. Um, with the Renaissance Act passing through the, the going through the process of being passed and some sanctions already being applied, what is the process? Is there any probability of the 1990 Nicaragua effect being repeated. That's a question for all of the panelists or whoever would like to go first. I don't think so. Um, definitely the population know what sanctions mean. There has been, uh, you know, there's been very little migration out of Nicaragua to the states for the last 15 years. And that has gone up in recent months. And, and part, there are many reasons. Part could be people thinking that things are going to get worse, but that there's gonna be any major thing of people voting against the Sandinistas because they think things are gonna get dramatically worse. Yeah, I don't think so. And I mean, if I, I'm not as much informed about Nicaragua as all the other panelists, but I know that when I was there, um, people kept referring to the the, the uh, period of neoliberalism as a big lesson, and that you know they can't expect you know if any if without the Sandinistas anything else does, that the United States wants is not going to result in anything uh, better. Francisca. Just uh, I I don't know Louise. The one thing I think is you don't have a coalition. You don't have a, a figurehead right now to be like Violeta Chamorro was. The symbolism, both from her drawing on the legacy of her husband 
and the fact that she had been a member of the of the first Junta de Gobierno de Reconstrucción Nacional, um, we don't have a figurehead like that. So I see that difficult. I think the real question and what the opposition is betting on, and that will remain to see, is that they are trying to encourage people, just like you do with the COVID, stay home, be safe. Oh, they're trying to encourage people not to vote. And they're trying to encourage absenteeism as a form of, of, of protest of the eligible voters. So to me, that will be one indicator and I will have to see what happens. Okay. I happen to think, I, I will have to see what happens, but I believe Nicaraguans are going to vote in considerable numbers. Um, you know, in the States, they always say you have less of an incentive to vote when you already have your party in office. And so that's one side, but there's another side that also knows that it is an historical moment and the FSLN and the Alliance are doing everything they can to have a broad-based voter turnout. Thank you, Sophia. Francisco, did you want to add something as well? Yep, I, I just wanted to emphasize one point, which is important in terms of campaign work or campaigning work. And it is this. When in here in the United Kingdom, but also in some of the other European countries, you, you indicate the source of the initiative for Renacer, for example. And then you end up with something like Ted Cruz or somebody like Marco Rubio and these sort of characters. Then things become totally clear. And from there, I think what works very effectively is you make that link to say these are exactly the same crowd that are actually organizing aggression against Venezuela, against Cuba, against Bolivia. So that's one extremely important point. If you, if you couple this with the very excellent information that Nan gave us about this structure, the methodology and everything else about the election, you know, how many safeguards and securities and transparency and impeccability to use that word. I'm not sure I just invented it, but do you know what I mean? Then that really, those two components, to get those two ingredients make the message extremely powerful. And I think our aim must be not necessarily to persuade, say, you know, people who are center left or left sort of center or not very sure left and they're not sure who what to support because it's too radical, that sort of thing. We don't want them to support the revolution, but we want it to support the right of Nicaragua to their sacrosanct right to self-determination. But on the other hand, we want them to abstain from ideally making an opinion. That in itself helps enormously. And it seems to me that we need to sort of somehow, well, we have done it somehow, and it is extremely important to point out the fact that these people are exactly said one final, I think, an interesting, important point. Whenever anybody raises the question of democracy with these countries or these governments, rather, usually the impulse, the discourse, come from the United States from some narrative that is originates in the State Department, and then is repeated by all the mainstream media and so on. Um, for example, when you contrast that with the following things, there are 17 uh, European countries that have no limits to re-election, none. So anybody in these 17 countries can actually be re-elected forever. The only reason they're not elected because they're terrible politicians and they apply terrible policies and the population do not elect them again. But for example, in the UK, there is no limit you can elect them as long as, you know, for as many times as you want. And therefore, taking lessons from, say, sources such as that, say, the Europeans, but also from the United States, I finish with this point. If you were to compare the shambolic election that they just had recently, when Joe Biden was selected, look at that mess. How democratic was that? How democratic it is, the impulse by the Republicans to actually, you know, try to suppress the vote, which is extremely important from our point of view. I always argue this, that we don't want to interfere in the internal affairs of the United States, 
But please, do not allow the United States to teach us any lessons regarding, you know, democracy, expansion of democracy, democratic rights and voting elections and so on, because they're the worst. And it seems to me that if you combine those things, you know, we, we can get somewhere. And the important point about this is to argue with those who are misguided, because the others, you know, perhaps are hopeless. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, Barbara, so, Net Netfa has his hand up. Oh, excuse me. Go ahead, Netfa. It's just a, it's really quick because I forgot to mention this in uh, the presentation that I'm going to be part of the delegation going back uh, to do, be, be part of an uh, electoral accompaniment. And so we plan to return and share our experiences. And, and so, um, yeah, we just we need we need to do these kind of things because the propaganda is so thick. If we don't have our own um, channels of, of assessing what's happening, then we're only subject to the to the, the misinformation of the of those who are really the enemies of humanity. Okay. Um, so we have a question from Michael Goodman, uh, which he phrased in two ways. So I'll just read them together. Um, I think he's making an assumption that might actually be an assumption that is questionable, but I'll let the answerers answer. What made Ortega shift his politics so radically from 1979 to today? Opportunism, thirst for power? Yes, but what I meant since the present day FSLN transformed things so radically. Nan? Well, if you look at the FSLN platform or program or historic, I forget the word, from 1969, and you look at what they did in the 80s and what they've been doing since they, they went back to the presidency, basically they're doing it all. I mean, I'd say number one overall is to eliminate poverty. That has been their number one goal for all of these years. And that's uh, so that other people can add to that. Who would like to, uh, Francisco? Oh, and Sophia, afterward. Um, I don't, if Jose wants to go first, I'll, I'll wait. Sophia? Um. Well, I agree wholeheartedly with what Nan said. I, we're in a different political context, but I believe the FSLN is working on eliminating poverty. It's working on inclusion and social and cultural inclusion of people on all parts of Nicaragua. It's not assimilation, it's inclusion and in recognizing their cultural and collective rights and recognizing the rights of small producers and recognizing um, the rights of women and recognizing the rights of small business people. Uh, so I, I think that there's, a, there's an assumption. My question would be more the opposite. What happened to the people who called themselves the MRS that called themselves at one point the true Sandinistas what kind of political party runs and seeks the patronage of the United States to prove its credentials? I find that very strange. I don't understand what kind of a Nicaraguan political party bases itself on the patronage of the United States. That certainly is not what I would call Sandinista. Thank you. Francisco? Yeah, this, this is... Uh you know, quite a central issue, it seems to me. Um, I don't think there will be elections today if the FSLN was not in, giving impulse to them. Let me put it this way. Had the opposition, the people who mobilized for the coup cool attempt in 2018, had they won, you can imagine what would have happened. Um, we have several examples to, in, to, to know what could have happened. So in Bolivia, the, there, was a coup, there was a coup, a successful coup in 2019 on the basis of a fraudulent false report by Luis Almagro, which created the conditions and the justification and legitimation for the coup. 
And we've seen what they've done in 11 months. 11 months. They destroyed democracy. They persecuted everybody. They arrested 1,500 people. They tortured, they practiced torture all over the place. And they practiced corruption to a level that the Bolivians haven't seen even before Evo Morales. I remember participating in a webinar with Juan Ramon Quintana, you know, who was the minister of the government under Morales. And he told us, he said, Francisco, it will take us between five to 10 years to undo the wave of corruption that they created only in 11 months. They set the economy back in no time at all. Evo Morales have to leave the country, flee the country and the vice president, Alvaro Garcia Linea, because they would have assassinated them. So you can imagine, I don't want to be sound catastrophic, but you can imagine, had the coup attempt in 2018 been successful, God forbid, it would have been a massacre. It would have been horrific. They began already to assassinate people during the so-called insurrection. They actually burned people alive. They did the same in Venezuela. And they were attacking, they were setting hospitals on fire. They were setting police stations, but they were setting houses with Sandinistas inside on fire. So that gives you an idea. And given that this was going to be presided over and guided by the United States, you can imagine that they would have applied a purge. They would have cleaned the country of all the bad elements. They would have extirpated the problem as they did in Chile. So, Anybody who believes that you know these people are going to bring any owns of democracy, they, they need to get their brains examined. On the other hand, and this is an important contrast, the Everson could have gone into revenge, and they never did. When it came to arresting people who actually committed crimes, they gave them, they, they liberated them later on. They were facilitating things and so on. Whereas if you compare in terms of the number of casualties from that point of view, there is no question about it. So the Everson has been true to his nature when they committed themselves in 1961, when they founded it, they committed to the following, in my view. They said, number one, I think it was a piece of genius to identify the organization that wanted to bring about democracy and social progress with the struggle of Cesar Augusto, Augusto Cesar Sandino. I think it's a piece of genius. In other words, they base what they wanted to do, their vision of society on the struggles in the past, in order to legitimize the struggle of the presidency in 1961, 79 and so on, to build the future that they needed. And look at what they've done. Every time they come to office, things improve massively. Every time they're not, it's a complete catastrophe in chaos, massacres, poverty, and so on and so forth. So in my mind, there is no question about it. The issue is we don't have the power that the mainstream, mainstream media had to actually convince people. And from the strategic point of view, I think we can have more significance in Europe than we can have in the United States. But that's something for a tactical strategic discussion of some other nature. We are at uh, our 90 minute, um, well, uh, whatever time period. And I'm conflicted as to whether con to continue right now because it seems like there are some more very good questions that could be answered if people are willing to stay on. Um, what do others think? Uh, let's start with the panel. Do you wanna continue a little bit or should we stop? And given that Nicaragua is so important, this election is so important, I'm quite happy to stay on. Okay, it sounds like the panelists are willing. So if anyone has to leave uh, in the, um, the participants, we understand, but thank you for those who are interested and would like to stay. Louise, I think you have the next question. Okay, um, thank you. There's a question about the, the fact that the Nicaraguan, the constitution was changed uh, by Daniel Ortega and, uh, and his wife to enable them to stay on for as long as they want. So uh, that, that was just a, a brief question if anybody on the panel would like to answer it. Francisco. I'll have a go because I don't have any complications with this one. 
Um, I think the key principle that should guide everything, I know there are, you know, constitutions and, and um, specific prescriptions. I think the people in any country should be entitled to elect whoever they want. And if any uh, reform of the constitution, all countries reform their constitutions, their principles. In the United Kingdom, there is no constitution. And it keeps being reformed anyway all the time, as we know, despite the fact that it doesn't exist as a written document except the one, the Carta Magna. So given that that's the key principle, the test of the, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So if people, accept that that is the case and they re-elect in a clean election, I don't think there is any problem. The United States would accept any re-election by anybody, anywhere, provided that is their, is their guy. But on the other hand, whenever they, they believe they're not going to control the country that they want to control, then they find all sorts of excuses. The important point for me is that we in the progressive side of the world the one to build a better world should not fall for these little tricks. You know, the key is the essential process. Do you want to secure social progress and democracy in a country such as Nicaragua? And if there is a need to reform the existing law, which is done properly, I don't have any problem with that. Thank you. Anyone else? No. Okay. Back to you, Barbara, I think. Okay. Oh, goodness. Uh, do you have another question, Louise? I could use another minute to pick out my next one. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, I've, I've got one um, regarding the case of Dora Maria Tellez. Um, somebody who actually said that she is disturbed by this case because um, she, she knew her as a woman and was highly respected and esteemed during... Uh, her 14 years in Nicaragua and do any of the panelists have any information or can they comment on why she and and others have taken a seemingly unprincipled turn to ally themselves with um, members with the US um, uh, opposition in Nicaragua. Nan. You're on mute Nan. as briefly as possible, a number of the Sandinistas who were in very powerful positions in the 80s, when the Sandinistas lost, they seemed to think that was it for a, a more, really more progressive uh, sort of socialist kind of government. And they got together and over the next four years, uh, really uh, began to form this new party, which really would have been a, I guess, just sort of like the Democrats in the States. And they thought they could steal away the base from the FSLN, but they found in the 1996 elections when their uh, candidate was Sergio Ramirez, they didn't get even 2% of the vote. And that's the most they've ever gotten. And along the way, they've told many, many lies about people in the Sandinistas to try to convince people in the base to go with the MRS. But, you know, that, that really, they've had so few followers all along, but almost none, I'd say, for the last 20 years. Um, so she is one of the ones, I mean, not all of them, but many of them have been funded by the US and by Europe, have created non-governmental organizations that have been funded, and they used this money to uh, uh, do the coup in 2018. Many of them, including Dora Maria, were actually people, you know, running the show, totally participating, taking money out to the the thugs at the um, roadblocks uh, to give them alcohol and drugs and food and other things to keep them going. Um, 
And it's really, you know, it's unfortunate, but you're talking, these people chose the route of total violence and they chose a very anti-democratic route. And, um, you know, I, they'll never get in anywhere with this population, the majority of the population, whether actually, whether they're Sandinista or from some of the other parties running now, you know, just think very, very little of, of these former Sandinistas. Okay. Thank you very much, Nan. Anyone else, Francisco? I mean, if I may, I want to bring the Chilean experience here for a particular reason. When you suffer a, a defeat, you know, and the defeat in the 1990s was really bad, then the movement that leads is, is thrown into turmoil. I think that's inevitable. People have to try to explain what happened, what we did wrong or didn't, what we should have done or shouldn't, should have done and so on. And as a consequence of that, there, are, there is political fragmentation and political divisions. I remember I followed the debates in the Evzelen in the 1990s after the defeat. And you know, some leaders drew the conclusion that it was not possible to defeat imperialism. And therefore, the only thing you could do rather than a radical transformation of society, you should go for accommodation and go for something more social democratic. That's one option. Um, in my view, is definitely wrong, but that was one option of one of the currents. And as a result of that, there was this fragmentation, and as Nan explained, there was this group. And the test is exactly what the masses will do. And you know, the masses tend to be quite wise not necessarily all the time, but certainly they're quite wise, especially after they have an experience of revolution from 1979 to 1990. They knew what, what it was. They knew what it was like. They knew what works, and they knew what to do, what not to do, regardless of the tactical complications and the relation of forces, which was very complex in the 1990s. And these people decided to go for one particular option. They wanted to present themselves as the radical critiques of the FSLN, and they got their, you know, they got a bloody nose, as it were, by themselves, not that anybody did it to them. They did it because they got a mis they made a mistake. And then the evolution of them became worse and worse and worse to the point that it seems to me in the progressive world, it should be um, absolutely essential. You can never, ever, ever, no matter how, what your differences may be, ever, ever lean and, and get supported by imperialism to overthrow by violence, a government that is clearly progressive. This is completely unacceptable. And as a result of that, they never go anywhere because the masses knew. And it seems to me that that's the explanation. It's a real pity, you know, she was a hero. There's no question about it. She played a very important role at that time, but then later on it didn't. And my children experience tells me that Many people that I knew in the 1970s that were wonderful became terrible pro neoliberal guys that participated in all sorts of horrible things. So I'm not surprised. Therefore, life is like that. And we have to draw the right conclusions and support the people who are going to ensure democracy and social progress. And that is the FSLM government. <laughs> um. Thank you for those responses. There was an interesting uh, entry in the chat which addresses the question that I posed at the very beginning. So I'm just going to read what is said here, uh, put in by somebody named Daz Thor Zerland. Um, one thing that the opposition is doing is to keep a low profile so, so that it seems as if there is no opposition participation in the electoral process. At the same time, they try to get the most advantage they can from their election participation in terms of votes in government positions. This allows them to say that elections were not valid if they do not get good enough results. Okay, thank you for, for that. Um, and I'm wondering, would anybody like to just add any, any uh, comments? I know a lot has already been said but there is one person uh, here, Susan Sim, who would like to know a little more about what 
all are the policies supported by the FSLN. I know especially we've, we've already talked about anti-poverty and some of these things, but would anybody like to add something about the policies? Okay, Sophia. I'll just add a few. We've had some webinars that deal specifically with some of the programs that the Frente Sandinista has been promoting. But for example, uh, when I talk about universal health care, um, this is a tremendous challenge for a country as poor as Nicaragua because we're trying to build an infrastructure, but the infrastructure and to provide health care throughout the country to make it accessible in remote areas, to make it accessible in each one of the departments of Nicaragua, I means the geographical um, accessibility of people to healthcare. It also means training doctors, and it also means training for the first time, Nicaragua now has um, careers in health management and health services, because we are expanding the amount of medical personnel we're increasing the amount of specialties. Now you don't only have, you have subspecialties. We're performing neonatal surgery. We're performing um, heart surgery on children. Uh, we're performing kidney transplants. Those were things that in the past were done by medical brigades that would come and visit Nicaragua. So I'm just trying to give you an idea when we talk about healthcare and when we talk about having mobile health units that actually go out and provide services to people that they can get uh, a pap smear, that they can get um, you know, treated for respiratory infections so that they can get some uh, preliminary uh, dental examinations, things like that. That's unheard of, Nicaragua didn't have it. And in fact, in 2018, several of those mobile units were burned by, by the opposition, which to me was just a terrible crime. Um, when we talk about access uh, and, and, you know, these also includes voices should be heard, my community, um, my hospital, they include house to house visits. So when we were working on the COVID-19, it meant literally they visited 4 million homes in the space of about two and a half months. And um, some of the houses they visited two or three times, looking in, in different areas and trying to help people with hygiene measures and things to do. The social tracing that was done was quite commendable for a government uh, with the resources that Nicaragua had, but it set up a, a hotline and, and it was there. When it comes to education, the education also recognizes the limits of poor families in Nicaragua. So it's not just access to universal healthcare, meaning building schools at the primary and secondary level, but it also means, you know, a glass of milk or the food lunch system, which for many, many families is an important part of their nutrition. Nicaragua is working on food sovereignty, but it's also working not just that people get a sufficient caloric intake, but that they get nutritious foods, that they are eating a variety of foods that um, actually helps to make sure that they will get the development that their bodies need to develop their different organs and to develop their brains. That's an important part of what the Food and Agriculture Organization promotes and has commended Nicaragua for making important headway in this um, hambre cero, zero hunger, so that people get food, but they also get nutritious food. Um, there's efforts in terms of they're talking about policies to deal with disaster relief. In a country that we are a quarter, we have the dry, corridor in Nicaragua, and it gets worse and worse with climate change. So we're looking at types of foods that might be, we might be able to produce there and how we would introduce them into the Nicaraguan diet. But we're also looking at what to do if there's a natural disaster, whether it's a tsunami, whether it's an earthquake, whether it's the flooding like we had last year um, from the hurricanes, how Nicaragua can respond quickly and courageously to these types of situations, which we know are likely to increase in the future. 
Um, it includes policies like road systems, which is part of Nicaragua, not just for Nicaraguans to be able to get their produce to market and have accessibility. It also is part of the policy to deal with regional integration. We know that a lot of commerce, a lot of trade routes go through Nicaragua from north to south primarily, I mean, from south to north primarily, but both ways. And we're also looking, um, you know, the recent agreements um, with the Gulf of Fonseca, we'll also be looking at maritime routes as being another possibility for greater regional cooperation. Nicaragua has excellent relations with BICE, which is where it gets some of its key funding. And Nicaragua consistently, despite the negative press in the United States, Nicaragua consistently gets high reports from UN, from the Food and Agriculture Organization, from the World Bank, from the IMF, from BICE in terms of project execution, that projects are built according to the time plan, the money is spent on what it's supposed to be spent on and projects get completed. You can just travel on the roads here and you will see that projects execution is has done very, very well in Nicaragua, even despite the events in 2018, and even despite the, the hurricanes that we had last year. Um, what would be some other, in terms of uh, public policies of Nicaragua? Uh, climate change is, a, is, is another big one. Uh, literacy, literacy work. In addition to the education system, Nicaragua still conducts to this day, literacy campaigns in different parts of the country and we do them in different languages. That's a tremendous thing for a third world country to do, and particularly for a country like Nicaragua with limited resources. Nicaragua is working on some new, quite new for, for Nicaragua, but they have to do with nanotechnology and with uh, working with uh, Russia and others to develop the scientific capacity capacity to develop some of the nanotechnology. And we're also looking at space development. We're working at the level of Central America and Mexico, at the level of Latin America, and also with other international partners on space, which we know, like we had the law of the sea in Nicaragua, we know that space is the new frontier for, for the entire planet. And Nicaragua is a small, tiny country, but it's looking at it, it's looking forward, it's training people inside of the foreign ministry in international law that governs space exploration and other things. I think all of these show a Nicaragua that's looking to the future and trying to see how it can have, uh, Nicaragua is ambitious. It's not pretentious, but it's very ambitious in its desire to modernize in an inclusive people-centered development model. Thanks. I hope that helped. I think that was excellent, Sophia. Thank you very much. Well, we have uh, greatly exceeded our, our time limit. And um, I think we're, we're grateful for all those who were able to stay on, especially the speakers and the, the uh, tech people who have helped us out today. Uh, so we're going to end it now, but we thank everyone very much. And as we said, we will be sending out uh, the links to the Zoom webinar itself, the recording, as well as the chat and um, the resources that were included in the chat. Uh, Louise? Yep, it's been a really great webinar. Thanks again to everybody, to our, it's been great to co-host this with Alliance for Global Justice. Thank you for the opportunity to do that. Thanks for our, our technical support and also to our, our brilliant speakers. It's been a fantastic evening and uh, thanks everybody for participating and uh, hope to see you at a future event. Thank you, good night.